Allow me to preface what you are about to hear by a clarification. I have never been a very emotional person. Oh, feelings? Yeah, I don't have those anymore. Went cold turkey. What? I thought at first it would just be the typical child slash teen rebellious phase of yeah I can watch 50 men get brutally slaughtered and feel nothing at all. You know, the edgelord age. And while that certainly might have played a part in that disposition, and I like to think that I have become ever so slightly wiser and more compassionate since those cringe-worthy days, I still can't honestly claim to feel all that much, no matter the type of genre of the media I consume. I don't often get sad at emotional scenes, I rarely get afraid during horror movies, and though I am by no means a fan of gore or gratuitous sex scenes, it takes a lot for any story to seriously disgust me. This characteristic has made some aspects of my work more difficult for me. As an aspiring writer, I often have trouble gauging just what emotions my scenes might elicit within my readers, and I tend to go for a more analytical, critical approach, both when writing my own stories and reviewing others. There is a small, select pool of stories which can stake a claim at my heart, and that club has a very, very limited membership. So when I say there are scenes within this manga that made me feel sadness, discomfort, and most importantly, dread, rest assured that to be no mean feat. Chainsaw Man is currently one of the most popular manga on Shonen Jump, which in and of itself is quite impressive given how many scenes within it push the envelope of Shonen straight into very very grim dark sign and it is slated for an anime adaptation set to come out later this year and by the time this video comes up the first trailer will probably have been released it has been met with an overwhelmingly positive reaction from the majority of the readership and managed to remain in top sales spots while competing with a number of series with an anime adaptation already in the works since dark fantasy and urban fantasy are both something of a forte of mine, I eventually gave in to peer pressure and decided to check out the story for myself early. Jonathan, listen to me. After all, despite everyone having high hopes for the adaptation and Studio Mappa being largely respected by fan communities, we don't actually have any confirmation that the adaptation will be able to do the original story justice. Jonathan, just... Walk away. So I thought, what the hell, might as well give it a shot early and see how it goes. What have you done? Finished it. Three days later, and after many, many, many hours of immersive reading, I have finished the series with a heavy heart and a bright red forehead to boot, a result of me repeatedly slamming my head against the desk while berating myself for not having waited for the anime adaptation to drop. The main reason for these is that if MAPPA can animate this series half as well as they have my favorite Jujutsu Kaisen or certain other contemporary shows, there are scenes in this manga which are in the running to become classics in every department, action, drama and particularly horror. And while still suffering from mild brain trauma, I got the bright idea to try and do the series justice in a video essay. Because surely I can manage that, right? Wrong. But look at me, here I am appraising a series some of you might be completely unfamiliar with. So, what is Chainsaw Man as a story, and why did it succeed where so many other stories failed miserably, trying and failing to warm my cold, dead heart? Chainsaw Man is set in an alternative 1990s Japan in a world where devils, in this case, spirit-like predatory creatures who embody various aspects of humanity's collective fear, have become a fairly common occurrence, manifesting in the real world, preying on humans, stealing pets, and generally being a public nuisance. While the setting is not drastically different to the world we might recognize from real history, there are a couple of key changes. For example, the Soviet Union is still kicking around, 
even as Germany remains a unified country and seems ostensibly independent from US interests, while China appears to have come under military dictatorship of some sort. More notably, however, governments of the world have imposed a set of strictly enforced and somewhat draconic measures upon their populace, all of these stemming from the threat of devil attacks. Guns, for example, are extremely rare and hard to come by due to how much fear they would elicit from the collective human populace, which would make its corresponding devil, the gun devil, extremely powerful. Similar restrictions are placed upon a number of other similar items, which results in a world that feels just alien enough to seem familiar while being a unique. It's like you're feeling there are pieces of a puzzle missing whenever you learn something new about the world. And believe me, the last thing you want to do when reading this manga is not pay attention to details. Devils are of course the main attraction of the setting, as well as the majority of antagonists who our heroes have to face down over the course of the story. Although they are called devils, it is unclear exactly what relationship they have to THE devil with the capital D when they first appeared, or what the cause or purpose of their behavior might be. A number of allusions is made towards their Abrahamic inspiration, especially later on as the series progresses, but religion and belief never factor into the overall story, nor do we ever find out how religious institutions view this variant of hell on earth. All we know for sure is that devils exist and embody the many aspects of humanity's collective fears. How feared whatever they represent is determines their levels of power. Should a devil be killed on earth, it shall return to hell, or whatever passes for hell in this setting, deprived of any memories or personality traits it might have acquired on earth, and should it then be killed in hell, the same process occurs in reverse. Thus, with, while devils are functionally immortal, their identities are reset so much it would be fairer to say that their concept is immortal, seeing as memories and personal upbringing form a more than considerable part of who we as individuals really are. Devils frequently act in a predatory manner when dealing with humans. Depending on their levels of power and intellect, their hunting style can range widely from blunt animalistic attacks through very simple and basic schemes to careful and crafty manipulations. Some devils, usually those of more considerable power, can form contracts with humans, though even these are usually underpinned by some sort of sacrifice on the human's part. Usually devils will require pieces of flesh and blood as their payment, though some of them can accept more esoteric means of payment as well. Forming contracts with devils is, in fact, not only the primary manner of exercising other devils, but has been increasingly becoming the main manner of armed conflict, both internal and international, within the Chainsaw Man world. From a purely world-building standpoint, this world is not half bad, but does not particularly stand out either. As I said, the changes are just noticeable enough to register for the reader, but for the most part, the civilian world, bereft of immediate demonic incursion, works in much the same way it has in the original 1990s. What sets the Chainsaw Man world apart can be found in the meta sense, namely, the value of human life, or rather, lack thereof. Chainsaw Man is one of the more brutal manga series I have read, not only due to the sheer amount of gore and bloodshed on display, although that too is considerable, but rather what makes it stand out against its competition is the flippant disregard for human life, the world and not a few of the characters within it frequently display and espouse. The story is unabashedly nihilistic at multiple points, and the frankly disturbing number of wretcheds who are introduced, developed and then killed off in the most useless, often insulting way possible, makes for a very powerful message. They say, don't get attached to characters about, well, everything nowadays, but in Chainsaw Man, that advice is basically useless. You often will not get a chance to get attached to a character before they are unceremoniously and senselessly killed off. Even deaths played off as heroic sacrifices at the time often have little to no impact on the outcome of any given conflict, and the number of people who die, alone, afraid and confused is far, far greater. The one scene which sold for me not only the manga but its brutality in the narrative sense beyond simply being gory 
is the moment when a bunch of humans trapped in a high stakes battle they appear to be winning start getting literally and very graphically squashed like flies by an invisible, undefeatable force. Inquisitorial stormtroopers of the Ordo Tempest is present. We are actively trying not to explode. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Although the scene is presented as more of an action scene, to me personally it was something right out of the thriller. And along with one other contemporary event, the moment which sold to me just how little human life, all human life protagonists very much included, actually meant in this world and how disgustingly overpowered devils could be when compared to humans. Which brings me neatly towards the one thing which sets Chainsaw Man's world apart and a topic which permeates the story through its characters, themes, and even the rather simple magic system. Existential dread is the term I finally arrived at after pondering for far too long what it is about this series that seemed so unusually threatening. It isn't something most people might expect from a work which often doesn't seem to take itself very seriously, but it dawned on me about halfway through that all of the protagonists really did feel hopelessly outclassed. In one particular scene, the story veers almost into, well, outright cosmic horror even Lovecraft himself would have found palatable. And even after that scene ends, the story never does quite go back to how things were before. There is a distinct sense of dread and hopelessness precipitating every single confrontation, something not readily associated with most shonen titles. Despite many of the characters within the story possessing varying degrees of useful powers, either through their contracts, or through being devils themselves, or through being the goddamn goat, the price most humans pay for accessing a devil's powers even once are horrific, and there is no guarantee that your sacrifice is going to be meaningful in any way. This is reflected in the way the Devil Hunters, the designated Monster Hunter Inc. of this world, operate. All the easy, lucrative contracts involving the sale of devil body parts and fighting pest-level monsters goes off to private contractors and talented freelancers while the messy, greedy, heavy lifting is, as usual, left to the government-funded public safety office. It is stated early on that unless an individual is really serious about their commitment to the cause, they either leave or die within the first few months at most. And we see time and time again, the second option is even more likely for those who do decide to stick around. Add to that the fact that the number of devils humans have to fight is essentially infinite, since devils as entities are constantly reborn, and you get a world in which humanity leads a constant, grueling, unwinnable war against beings who can kill you, or worse, almost by accident, with no hope of a permanent victory. To face such odds and have any hope of leading a normal life is pretty much impossible for any sane person. You live with the knowledge that at any point, due to the slightest of slip-ups, your life could be over and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. And the manga demonstrates this time and time and time again by viciously and filthily murdering its characters with a cavalier disregard a Bolshevik commissar could only dream of attaining. And speaking of filthy, this manga is dirty. No, no, not like that, get your mind out of the gutter. Well, mostly not like that. But anyway, I mean it very literally. The world is filthy in the most basic sense of the word. Tatsuki Fujimoto does a consistently excellent job of having his art style complement his themes and setting, often coming across as very gnarly, blurry, smudgy, with a lot of small imperfections and random splashes of paint to emphasize the seedy, slimy nature of the whole thing. Even when characters sweat, it almost looks like they're made of wax and are starting to melt under intense heat, emphasizing the sticky, smelly nature of such a situation. Not to mention the background art is usually very well done, the rooms feel lived in and cluttered with random insignificant stuff, and even the narrow alleys and tunnels our heroes sometimes descend into feel real and inhabited. It's not going to be rivaling the likes of Berserk by any means, but it serves to excellently complement the main premise of the story, which is one of the main purposes of any solid art style. So. With the basics of the setting out of the way, 
What is the story of Chainsaw Man about? Well, we meet our main character, Denji, contemplating on what a good trade it was to sell his kidney, his right eye, and one of his testicles in rapid succession. Please erase these mind images immediately. And how now? He is only 38 million yen in debt. Off to a brilliant start there, aren't we? To pay off his deceased father's ludicrous debt, Denji is essentially an indentured servant to the local Yakuza, who use him as a local private devil hunter. The reason why Denji hasn't yet been torn to pieces, devoured and smeared across the floor is his pet and only friend in the whole world, Pochita, a charming little cartoon dog with a goddamn chainsaw sticking out of its forehead. Pochita too is a devil but is for some reason friendly towards Denji and has formed a favorable contract with him which allows Denji to use it as a weapon against the devils he hunts. This job allows Denji to barely scrape by on the handouts he gets from the Yakuza, although he still lives in absolute poverty and his greatest dream is to be able to know what bread with jam tastes like. Kind of a mood killer. Even in the opening chapter, the vileness and ugliness humans are capable of is not censored in any way, nor are the lows people are able to sink towards to survive downplayed. At one point, a Yakuza thug, impressed with Denji's simplistic, dog-like obedience, gives Denji a lit cigarette to swallow in return for a few measly bucks. And Denji does so, with a smile on his face. Now granted, he does immediately spit the cigarette back out as soon as they're not looking, but it immediately demonstrates one important aspect of Denji's character, which contrasts him against your average shonen protagonist. This is not a person to whom higher concepts like dignity and self-respect and justice matter. This is a person so utterly beaten down and screwed over by his life that swallowing a burning cigarette for the petty amusement of some random goon is a no-brainer because it means he won't go hungry for the night. Things don't really get better from here on out. Oh, there's a big surprise! That's an incredible... I think I'm gonna have a heart attack and die from that surprise! And by the end of the chapter, one thing leads to another, and Denji and Pochita wind up murdered, chopped into pieces, and dumped inside a trash can, which concludes our short and harrowing tale. That's it? Where's the meat? <laughs> Just kidding. Naturally, Pochita pulls a heroic sacrifice of sorts and opts to fuse with Denji in a process which never really gets explained. At least for now, the manga is slated for a sequel, which could hopefully shed more light on the unexplained bits from the first part. Denji revives, very much alive, at peak physical condition, and even fully cured of his self-mutilation, and, oh yeah, now armed with the ability to sprout a pair of motherfucking chainsaw hands from his elbows, and another one from his head. Unfortunately, he is surrounded by the people who murdered him. But you know how that song and dance goes. Yeah, something to that effect. After the massacre, Denji is quickly found and grabbed by the public safety devil hunters who wish to use his power for their own ends. And from there, the story follows Denji throughout his not-so-illustrious career of devil hunting. To summarize as a protagonist, Denji is by no means a protagonist driven by high ideals, personal sense of right and wrong, or even a desire to protect the ones he loves because, well, plain and simple, he doesn't have anyone to care about for most of the story. Having been a slave for his whole life, his desire is the purest, simplest form of materialist freedom there is. All he wants is food, women and wine! Very literally, in fact. A common criticism I have seen of the series is that Denji is nothing but a horny horn dog for much of the story, and this aspect of his personality remains all the way through to the end of the story, albeit in a slightly older state. He's also dumb, like really, really really proper dumb, and I don't just mean uneducated, which would be perfectly understandable and wouldn't belie his capacity for quick thinking or insightful planning, I mean Denji is actually, genuinely, a fucking moron, with a thinking so basic a child would find him an idiot, to illustrate with a slight spoiler. Let me describe the brain damage. You stand before a person who has repeatedly and vehemently tried to slaughter you for most of the last night and made clear their homicidal intentions towards you. However, you, for whatever reason, feel like you can get to this person to try and reason with them. Do you a keep your distance and try to negotiate from afar? 
B. Try to immobilize this person, who, mind you, has a healing factor, and so you could very well get rough with them, to try and make sure they don't try to attack you while you're talking to them. Or C. Do you try to carelessly approach and embrace them? If you answered C, congratulations, you too could be the protagonist of Chainsaw Man and get your neck snapped for your trouble. Well, that's brain damage! If you know you're not supposed to do something, and you do it, and then people say, why did you do it? You say, I don't know. Brain damage. By the way, don't worry about the neck snapping thing. Due to his fusion, Denji has acquired one hell of a healing factor, which means that no matter how bad the damage gets, unless he sustains a very specific kind of injury, he will regenerate from even the most gruesome injuries. Which contrasts pretty sharply against the very frail and fragile state of almost every single other character, and leads into one of my main points of criticism. The battles of Chainsaw Man are not at all my kind of style. The problem with Chainsaw Man battles, and bear in mind this is entirely my subjective preference, is that they rely entirely on spectacle and emotional pathos over clever tactics or well-defined techniques, and while some devils Denji and the others face can have a condition or a power which is difficult to circumnavigate, at the end of the day it all comes down to good old-fashioned slugging match when it comes to the fight choreography itself, and that in and of itself is Fine. It also feeds somewhat into the general moral myopia of utter helplessness when facing high-end devils, but compared with many other shonen systems such as Jujutsu Kaisen's Cursed Energy, Hunter x Hunter's Nen, or even Demon Slayer's Breathings, the combat falls short for any viewer who might have come for an interesting application of a varied power set. This could change in the sequel, with Denji showing slight signs of growth when it comes to battle tactics, but for now, Denji is more likely to botch any combat advice he is given. However, on the spectacle side of the scale of Fujimoto, spared no expense. the designs of the individual devils in particular range from bizarre looking through gross to outright nightmarish, and all of them are completely utterly insane, like LSD high crossed with sleep paralysis levels of insane imagination. Where else could you ever possibly hope to see a woman with a detachable bomb for a head and a tornado made out of swirling intestines going up against a guy with motherfucking chainsaw heads, riding a land shark with freaking chainsaw heads attached to their heads. The monster design alone makes every initial confrontation interesting, and few fights drag on for long enough to become downright stale. But anyway, I digress. Back to Denji as a protagonist. I have mentioned that I understand the criticism of him just being too simplistic, hedonistic and stupid to be a compelling character, and while I do understand where that criticism comes from, and he's by no means a character I would prefer or really identify with in any way, I have to wholeheartedly disagree with the claim that this makes him a bad character, quite the opposite in fact. The main reason behind this assessment is how wonderfully Denji plays into the central driving narrative of the story, which really is actually quite compelling once you dive beneath the surface. Ultimately, once I'd consumed the last page of the last chapter and sat down to think on what the story of Chainsaw Man is really supposed to be about, the answer actually became remarkably simple. It presented itself to me in the flippant and excessive waste of human life, the nihilistic fatalism so many of its characters openly embrace, in the seedy, dark nature of the locations our heroes constantly threw themselves into. It could be seen when a character finds out in a heartbreakingly casual way, that their life's work has all been for naught, when another character remains trapped for hours on end in a dark, bloody parody of an ordinary date, when even a minor, comedic idiot's lifetime motto of being immortal is first twisted into irony, then reforged into desperate determination, and finally reduced to nothing but a mere factual statement framed by luck and coincidence. Everything screams at you. Real life is short, bleak and cruel, and it would be better to keep living in an ignorant, dreamy fantasy than try to force reality to bend before you. Is that the message then? That it would be best for us to remain unaware of how horrible our life can get, to shelter ourselves from the horrors of the night, the terrors of death and the pain of loss? Well, that's certainly how Denji initially interprets it, and by god does he try to live by it. I've said before that 
Denji starts out and remains for the longest time the world's happiest hedonist. Happiest because, to a guy who has never known any pleasure, every pleasure is initially exquisite. His job as a devil hunter, though bothersome, isn't actually all that difficult for him since he is functionally immortal and has those motherfucking chainsaw hands and is frankly too dumb to concern himself over much with the possible limits of his new powers. Nor is he slowed down by care for other people. He's not outright dismissive of others' well-being, but let's just say charity work is not exactly his forte when it comes to socializing. And, well, being a devil hunter pays. A lot. And there's lots of things to spend it on. Not to mention, now that he can afford a bath, he might be able to ask a girl out without the unfortunate female running off at the merest sniff of his stench. Who knows? Maybe he might even accomplish his lifelong goal of feeling a girl's chest. I'm sorry. Save this man. What? Yes, that is actually what he decides will be his life's main aspiration. And let's just say that his reaction once he succeeds actually had me chortling. Still, leading the good life for Denji is more than a sufficient reward. He gets saddled with next to no responsibilities, a bunch of rewards and privileges, and all he has to do in return is something he basically considers a favor. That ought to suffice for a dumb horny teen, eh? Except, of course, it doesn't. And the chest incident aside, Denji does continue to feel like there is something sharply missing from his new life. Something more important than a pair of real breasts. He can't for the life of him figure out what it is, or why he continues to put up with things he really, really doesn't need to and shouldn't have to. And eventually, he decides he doesn't even want to figure that much out. He doesn't want to care, he doesn't want to be slowed down by the incontinence of his free will and curiosity. Ultimately, despite wanting freedom more than anything at the start of the story, like so many slaves, Denji comes to believe himself too free for his own good. And so, at one point, he does surrender his free will. And well, uh, let's just say things don't exactly work out and leave it at that, shall we? So then, what is the message of Chainsaw Man? The world is so obviously and clearly unjust, cruel, spiteful, dark and malicious, and now you're telling me I can't even escape into the blissful fantasy to hide from it? Well... That's no good! So what am I supposed to do? Well, that's easy. Easy, but cruel. Face it. Face what you fear. Face what you find daunting. Face what has defeated you before. Face whatever it is that seeks to control you. Do it again and again until you can win over it. Think faster, plan smarter, fight harder, see more, hear more, do more. And as you do so, don't do it only for yourself, though enjoying the one life you're given is still very important and nobody's going to deny you your goddamn sandwich for breakfast. Do it for the people who matter, for the friends to whom you promised, for the loved ones you've lost, for those who gave themselves so you could be where they are today. Don't just dream, live your dreams and do not let them be corrupted through the efforts of yourself or others. That is the contract we all should make. And thus, I find it quite poetic that Denji, who starts the story as a slave wishing to take the initiative over his own life, progresses into a mindless tool who willingly allows others to take the initiative from him, ends the first part of his story taking the initiative not only for himself, but for others as well, those who cannot or will not do so themselves. And in the process, he very clearly molds and internalizes his previous struggles into something new and, hopefully, better. The fact he begrudgingly accepts some small amount of responsibility over his actions as his way of making lives, plural, better, a small yet incredibly satisfying piece of his and others' character arc, which elevates the entire manga from a simple, silly action flick into a story with more than a little genuine heart. So yeah, well, there you have it. A Bolts of the Walls insane dynamic story with memorable characters, cool aesthetics, and a distinctly dark, twisted sense of humor. What am I missing to finish this pitch off? Mm, lots and lots of dogs, uh, nah, that'll drive away the cat lovers. Uh, a harem of lesbian demons, Pff, that's gonna be a fairly niche king, right? That goddamn chapter...
No, 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 no. I don't want to spoil that. Ah, yes, of course. How could I forget to talk about her? You know, whenever I try to analyze a work, be it a book, a comic, or a film, I always really love whenever I chance upon living characters. And by these I mean characters who, while they are fictional, have very clearly lived a life of their own in the author's head, sometimes years or decades prior to the author even penning the first word of his piece. Makima, the head of Japan's public safety devil hunter's office and the person who initially discovers, recruits and then handles Denji, is precisely such a character, something proven to me after I took a quick look at some pieces of trivia surrounding the manga's development. Apparently, the concept of her character came to Fujimoto way back in high school, and she is quite possibly the oldest character in Chainsaw Man in a meta sense. Or possibly not. We don't exactly know. And that is but one of the things we don't really know about this mysterious woman. Despite the amount of page time she receives and how crucial she is to the narrative, many aspects of her are left deliberately vague, though I can assure you that a careful reader will be able to discern her deal a fair bit before the grand finale comes. Throughout the story, Makima remains as, if not more, central to the core narrative than Denji, as his personal motivations and characteristics revolve almost entirely around her whims and wishes. In fact, many characters explicitly have Makima as a part of their motivation, one way or another, and you do best to take note of that fact. Makima is always drawn, written and presented in such a way as to contrast with basically all the other characters, where most of our characters often get stained, grimy, dirty and roughed up, Makima remains dignified, clean cut and prim in almost all of her appearances and the one time she doesn't, one of her first requests is to get a clean shirt for herself, despite there being lives on the line, she's always graceful almost seductive without being an outright tease and seems to always know what to tell others in order to get them on her good side, one way or another. Makima is a deal maker, a power broker, a manager, the one who controls and restrains the underlings before they get out of line, the one who provides them with an incentive to fight, the one who knows the hearts of every one of her soldiers. Her power is not the brute force of Denji or the Devils. She has a much softer, yet firmer touch on the true conflict of the Chainsaw Man world. We are also very clearly shown how ruthless she can be in pursuing that conflict and how little it troubles her to be that way. She doesn't think twice about stooping to amoral actions to achieve her goals. Fortunately, as the leader of the public safety devil hunters, her goals seem ostensibly to involve hunting down those devils who might pose the greatest threat to mankind. Right? It's no wonder Makima is not only one of the most popular, but also one of the most recognizable characters from Chainsaw Man, despite her comparatively simple design. Everything about her from her looks, to her speech, to her disposition, sets her apart and contrasts her from the other protagonists, Denji most of all. And yet, their dichotomy is one of the most crucial aspects of the plot altogether. And let me just say, the payoff of their interactions makes every single scene they share twice as worthy of rereading. Whoever they end up casting, however they choose to bring her to life, this character, even more than Denji is the one that needs to leave an impact on the viewers once the anime is out. Because Makima, well, she is the order to Denji's chaos in this setting and a story like Chainsaw Man's cannot be told without firmly establishing either of those concepts. Well then, that about wraps it all up, for now at least. As soon as the trailer drops, I'll have a bit of an analysis ready and let's hope Mappa can do the story justice. For now, I wish you all a very happy night and until our next story is told.